Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. We're pleased to have this event sponsored tonight by the Institute for Politics and the Center for Public Leadership, both housed here at Harvard University, the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Now our conversation tonight is something that I'm sure has not escaped any of your eyes or ears or minds in recent months. Uh, take a look at the newspaper or even conversation with friends or even working on Main Street. The question is, are people in charge able to discharge um, their responsibilities in a form which is commensurate with what you would expect as Americans? We're pleased to have an amazing panel with us tonight, each of them in their own right having demonstrated a commitment to excellence and the common good. First, I'd like to tell you a little bit about them from my own eyes. First, Rosabeth Canner, who I became acquainted with in college through her work, um, Women and Men of the Corporation. Now, I grew up enjoying sociology because of W.B. Du Bois. And people said of him that he was a genius because his ideas were 25 years ahead of their time. Your work in Men and Women of the Corporation is still remarkable and insightful in companies that don't take advantage of your insights on what it takes to bring together a diverse group of people in an organization are, are still tremendous and organizations peril without it. So thank you for that. Next, I'd like to introduce David Gergen, who's been both an advisor and a teacher here at the Kennedy School. And what I like about David is he has this inextinguishable idealism and belief in what we can do to make this country better. If you know about David, you know that he's been involved in Washington for a while and seen ups and downs, but he comes here day after day with a sparkle in his eye, wanting the students here to sparkle. So that commitment, as, along with his example of putting country before party, has been tremendous for me. We at the Kennedy School can get caught up from time to time about party politics but he's a guy that's been supporting country politics, and he has an example to prove that. Last but certainly not least, a friend um, and mentor of mine, Bill George. Um, Bill is someone whose actions will always speak louder than his words in my mind. He set an example in corporate America about actually setting a goal, executing on it, and leaving when it was done. But more than that, as a teacher at the Harvard Business School, he encourages students both to have high standards for excellence and an uncompromising, uncompromising commitment to character as well. And I've appreciated that from Bill. Now, I'm from North Carolina, and I'm a student both at the Kennedy School of Government and the Harvard Business School. And you may be wondering what we hope to get out of tonight. Well, I hope that you get a chance to see how sincerely each of these individuals is about their commitment to seeing us make a difference as students and individuals here in America. And without further ado, the first question will go to David. Do we have a leadership, de leadership deficit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember during the Vietnam War that, uh, that, that, that uh, the uh, Johnson administration got such a, had such a credibility problem. They said they didn't have a credibility gap, they had a Kenyan. Um, and there's a certain quality about the deficit here, which is not a gap, but a Kenyan, I think, in, in the country today. If you, uh, if you try to measure leadership by whether those who are in positions of leadership, whether in formal authority without formal authority, as Ron Heifetz would argue, uh, the measure of a leader, in part, is how well that group, of which the person is the leader, how well they meet the challenges of their time. How do they, do they master, do they understand and then master the challenges? And I think that from a public standpoint, it's been increasingly apparent that uh, we are not meeting the challenges of our time here in this country that we see all sorts of problems accumulating now for the next president that are going to be overwhelming. Uh, you can, the, the, we, we spent a lot of our time in talking about 2008 in terms of the personalities. We really ought to be asking as well, 
what is it we have to do in the next in those four years? And do we have a who is who? Which one of these individuals is best or most capable of helping us solve those problems? Because I can tell you, the next four years after this person leaves office are going to be among the most consequential we're going to live through. That with decisions we make or don't make and fail to make in that time are going to be enormously important to the course of American history in the 21st century. And right now, I must tell you, I, it's in my judgment, this is not a partisan statement, but I would have to tell you that the leadership class of the country in public life, both Republican and Democratic, is failing the country. I think as a general proposition, the group of people who have been running Washington over the last 15 years, as a group, Many, many individuals in the group who are very fine. Many people are idealistic. Many people are very talented. But as a group, ha are, have failed. Uh, and I think the country is facing a much more difficult landscape now as a result of that. I know, and uh, I've been looking forward to this because this is an occasion when we're coming together uh, to a significant degree to celebrate Bill George's new book, uh, True North, which is here. Uh, and I, I must tell you that I think there are two answers uh, to helping to solve a leadership deficit. One is that you all ought to read <laughs> True North. And secondly, we need, we need to get Jonathan back to North Carolina as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, th well, thank you. Thank you. And just as a, um, as a note to everyone there, Bill will be signing books afterwards if you want to uh, learn more about True North. So. Rosa Beth, would you like to chime in on the question? Well, I always love what David Gergen has to say, and I agree that we have a leadership deficit, but I think it actually stems from something else, and it's not not finding the right individuals. I think it's a values deficit in America. I think we're getting the kind of leaders that institutions are seeking and that people have been willing to tolerate, and I think this um, runs through many sectors, and actually I think the public sector is in worse shape in this respect than the private sector now, and I'll explain that in a moment. And in fact, I've just finished a book, but it won't be out till October, so I'm not pushing it, um, called America the Principled. And in that, one of the chapters is, says, Restoring Respect for Government. If we've had 25 years of right-wing ideology saying that the only way to get elected is to government positions is to run against government. Isn't that ridiculous? No wonder we've had a lot of incompetence. So that's been an institutional problem, that there has not been sufficient value to serving the public interest, and that's run through nearly every sector. I mean, this is a country called the first new nation that was Supposedly, the first nation defined not by race or ethnicity, but by occupying common ground. Where has been the sense of the commons in recent years, of needing to work for things larger than one's own interest, and maybe even beyond the temporary interest of who happens to hold power in which institution? So, one of the issues that we were going to discuss before this panel was have we been teaching leadership effectively? I would say we've been teaching it just fine. But if institutions don't operate by a set of values and principles, then people of character find other ways to make their contributions. And right now we have a wonderful population of leaders in America. They're the social entrepreneurs in their 30s and 40s and even younger, but a whole generation that's grown up to change society, and they've chosen to do it not by running for elected office, but by starting social enterprises that would create direct action. They have values and a sense of the common good. Now, they're operating as private organizations in the public interest, and I would also say that the business world is beginning to shape up. Now, we've had egregious abuses, and I agree that we should be punishing abuses, and that's a whole other issue. But we've also had some large corporations stepping up to the challenge of managing with values and making that the hallmark of how they knit together global enterprises. 
And in fact, that's because they see that people want meaning and values. So I think if we begin to demand of people that they operate out of the best of themselves, not the worst of themselves, we could find that the leadership deficit goes away. And so I think it's not finding the magic individuals. I think it's reshaping what we expect from those who lead our organizations and the values that we want them to bring to that quest. Well, well thank you. Bill. Well, I think we have a major problem with choosing the wrong leaders by the wrong criteria. We choose our leaders based on their charisma, their image, and their style. And we should be choosing them based on their character and their integrity and their substance. And if you choose people by those three criteria, you shouldn't be surprised when people turn out to lack character and integrity and substance. Uh, I think we're operating on a 20th century definition of leadership, and we're in the 21st century. People in this country, and particularly in the business community, are not going to follow the great leader over the hill. We still have this World War II image of leadership. It's not about finding a great leader and follow him over the hill. We, are, we have an obsession with leaders on the top. It's not about that. It's how leadership is not about getting people to follow you. It's how do you empower people to step up and lead at all levels. Look at young Wendy Kopp. At age 21, she had an idea. She didn't know anything about leadership, knew anything about management. She stubbed her toe repeated times. But she is changing the world in her way because she's changing education through Teach for America. You know, remarkable. And I think we've got this idea that I should get all of you to follow me if I'm the leader. And that's just flawed. The idea is how can I empower you? And the great leaders today that I see are creating the context. They're creating this common ground, if you will, the shared mission and purpose and the shared set of values by which we all come together. That's the glue. We have to have that, otherwise we go flying off at the side. So I'm not just saying, everyone do your own thing. We come together around that, but then we empower people to step up and lead. And that's what I think our new leaders, certainly in the business community, what I call the post-Enron CEOs, are doing. And they consciously recognize people like Jeff Immel at uh, GE and Sam Palmasano at IBM and Ann Mulcahy at Xerox and Andrea Jung. They recognize how important this is. But we've got to get away from this old view of leadership as, not as you know, somehow we're running an assembly line and there are leaders and workers and everyone, all of you follow me, or you know, we had this obsession in the business community, certainly with the charismatic leader, and our boards chose the wrong people, and we're still trying to weed out those people, and there's still a few of them around. And I would almost say you can divide all leaders into two categories, and this is overly simplified, I realize, takers and givers, and we've been choosing the takers. And we need to have the givers who believe they're there, they're called to serve, that you're not there to serve the leader. I, if the leader is there to serve you. And David? Yeah, I, I, let me go, come back on that, because I very much agree with what Bill George just said. And it leads to some disagreement, I think, Rosabeth, from where you come out. I agree with you on the values point, but you're arguing values in terms, well, we, we had this conservative ideology that took over, and that's what swept us. Well, you said over the last 25 years, we've had this sort of, you know, this dismissive attitude toward government, as if that's the problem. I don't think that's the problem. I think it's more of a generational problem than an ideological problem. I, I, my own view is that the front end of the baby boom population, uh, the, and I'm part of this group, I'm sort of a preemie, but I'm still sort of the front end of it. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, but the group that has been sort of governing the country in the last year, almost all of the people at the top end of politically were born between 1940 and 1950. And I believe they're growing up, their coming of age experiences heavily influenced this group. This was a group that was uh, treated to a significant degree by a lot of their parents. They were, they were semi-spoiled. But more importantly, they came through the 60s, which was a, a period, 60s and 70s, which was enormous social change, much of which was extremely positive, but it left this generation very split, and there is no sense of common sacrifice in the group that came through that. And instead, I believe that a lot of people who come through those, those years have wound up in their governing years, their power years, whatever you want to call them, uh, as, more self, as too self-indulgent. Mm -hmm. They've been more the takers than the givers, to go back to Bill's point. And what I see behind them, and I think where you and I do agree, where Bill and, I, and all three of us agree, is I do see behind them in the group that's, uh, that's coming up now, the people 
25, 35, 40. There are a lot of people that saw Sean Trumpeter, as you mentioned, saw Wendy Cobb being a prime example. I see some of the younger people coming up in our political system. You know, we just had uh, the mayor of, uh, of Newark here, Cory Booker. He's a new kind of voice in our politics who, who is much younger. You see that, I think that's part of the inspiration of Barack Obama now. There, it's a different voice, and I think it's a more giving voice, and I think that's, and I, I think that's the hope right now that a lot of those folks are going to come into position of greater authority. I think it's a hope, but I think calling it generational, David, and not seeing the ideological underpinnings misses something very big, because those are the ideologies that had America saber rattling, that the ideologies that said, even in the, um, in the 90s, which are now looking like a fabulous era compared to the current era, that said that achievement was all that mattered, that making as much money as you could. I don't know whether that's simply because a generation has, has come to power, but the fact is it gets wrapped up in who institutions pick, what they look for. So I think we're agreeing on the fundamentals, but I don't think it's just we've got to wait for the right people to emerge. I think we have to more actively question values and ask what it is that we consider the ends of a society. And maybe it's because, I, I don't want to write off the, well, I was going to say I don't want to write off the baby boomers because that's us. And the baby boomers now in the rest of their life, um, in an initiative we're all working on, in the rest of their life want to give back just as much as the younger generations do. I think, however, they were driven by what institutions demanded of them during a particular era. And if we only think we'll solve the leadership problem by either waiting for a generation to replace another generation or teaching enough character, I believe those things are important, but we've got to add this third dimension of what the expectations are, what success means in the society. I was with you until you said that they followed what their institutions demanded of them. That's the core of the problem. They aren't following what I call their true north. They aren't following their inner moral compass. They're following what they think Wall Street wants to do in the business community. They're following what this little poll says or these voters said in the political community. We've got to get away from that. We've got to do what we think is right and not just kind of follow you know, what we hear of these institutional voices or follow the media or try to impress the media. And I think that's the problem. People get, they bow to the pressure and they get succumbed by the, they get su succumb to the, seduced by success and they play that game. And it worries the heck out of me in all sectors. And I don't know as much about the political sector as you guys do, but I certainly see it in the business community and every business leader I've seen succumb to Wall Street basically in the end uh, loses the entity of the corporation or they go downhill. Let's, so, look, at, let's look at this, this question of institutions just a little bit more. If you're a social entrepreneur, you can set the rules, largely. If, if you go in business, ideas win the day if they can be able to drive value. But, what, but government is still at the end of our, the center and the end of what we do as a society. In talking about the future, can we actually, what can we do to change the institutions? I mean, if they're not attracting the right people, I mean, you did, you did mention some new, new voices, but government, is, it goes from, not, from top to bottom. It's, government is not the end. Government helps to create a landscape in, in, in which individuals can thrive. Government should help to enable, put, help, enable individuals to then make it on their own. It's a question of creating a, a society in which people have, truly have equal opportunity. Government is not creating the end point, but it's trying to create a society in which people can be safe in their homes, they can, they, they, they can ex enjoy a certain amount of respect, but they also have a shot in life. You know, it goes back to what the Declaration says, and that's, and, and, and that's what we should be striving to create through government. But then it's up to the individuals to create a culture from that. We don't look to the government to, to do those things, but rather to create the landscape. We do look to people then who run corporations, I think, to be responsible actors within that system. To not be the Jeff Skilling type, you know, if he's famously said, I, I don't know whether it's true at the law school, you know, you know, the role of government, my job is to do whatever it takes to make money, and your job is to catch me. Right. You know, that. We that, caught him, yeah. and we did. Yes, yeah, but look at the price we paid. And he yeah. did say that. Yeah. 
So. Well, well, you know, this is an interesting issue in a debate because you said the social entrepreneurs call their own shots. They do in a certain sense, but they can only go so far without the wider culture and organizations surrounding them supporting what they do. I adore Wendy Kopp. I adore Alan Casey and Michael Brown at City Year. I've been on their board. I'll be the oldest living board member. I'll have to be wheeled out. I've been on their board for nearly 14 years. I think these are fantastic people, and I see the struggle because these are still marginal organizations because they still can't get large-scale capital to scale up. They're held up as models. We think they're adorable. Um, we you know that. Did you see what happened with Kip School last couple of days? What happened? They, just they got started. sixty-five million dollars. All right, we're on a roll. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. see, but if we don't look at the patterns, that's all I'm saying about institutions. I certainly, I love your book. I blurbed it. I, I, I always learn from what you say, David. But if we don't also look at all the vehicles we use to allow leaders to flourish or not, this is where my sociological side comes out. It's not just all psychology and character. It's also whether we do make sure that the money runs to those organizations with the values that we care about, that the context in communities supports the work that people want to do. Because otherwise, it's hard for even people with great character. Otherwise, we would have to wait for the unusual person like a Nelson Mandela who can overcome all odds to heal a country, but we don't want just one Nelson Mandela. We want hundreds, thousands, and millions of leaders, so we have to make it easier. So empowerment is also in the structures that we create that support the things we value or not. But adding on to that, empowerment, absolutely. And I think you're right. There's a lot of the social entrepreneurs, we can't get to scale. I think the real issue is, I went to government when I graduated from Harvard Business School. There was a whole group of 11 people in my class who went down there because we thought we could make a difference in the government. But we had a much more collaborative model in mind. Today, it's one institution against the other. You know, we have a, let's be honest, we have a unilateral foreign policy today. You know, everything is unilateral. It's my team against your team. You know, I, I'm so sick of this red and blue stuff. You know, the leading business leaders are telling me today that they know they cannot have successful corporations unless they collaborate. You know, oil companies can't be successful unless they can collaborate with governments that they probably can't stand, but they have to figure it out. They can't just say, you're the enemy. No, they have to figure it out. And that's certainly true of a great company like GE, you know, or an IBM. We have to figure out how can we collaborate. Andrea Jung came to the class and said, you know, we have to figure out how to collaborate with the Chinese so we can take our products and empower women in the hinterlands. Sure. But it's got to be a collaborative model. And even governments are not big enough to get it done. You've got to have a collaboration with the nonprofit sector, the public sector, and the private sector. So, do you, Bill, then, do you think that's the second way in which leadership has changed? You, the first argument you made is not, you know, follow me over the hill. It's got to be much more an influence model. Right. Now, the second argument you're making is it's also changed and it has to be much more collaborative. You simply can't do it with your unit anymore. You have to do it within a larger context, collaborating yes. with many other actors in a system. Yeah, I was very impressed and Sam Pomisano said, you know, we all followed a group of charismatic leaders, but we now realize we can't get it done. We have to work with governments if we're going right. to take our technology to these governments. We have to work with other organizations and team. There's no one organization in the world that's powerful enough to get it done. And we see what's happened when the U.S. government tried to do that because they thought they were. And so you need these social entrepreneurs to come in, but they also need somebody funded with 65 million, you know, that somebody had to show up right. with the money. And they need to, be, to it's, it's part of a network. It's yes. not just collaboration with your colleagues. Right. It's seeing the larger system. It's figuring out where your organization has a role, where they have a role, and respecting their knowledge. You know, the irony in what we're saying, now we're starting to talk about what great leaders can bring to make institutions operate more effectively. It's a little bit of a circular process. Once we do that, we'll probably produce more yeah, leaders. Yeah, but, yeah, but, because great leaders reproduce themselves. Yeah, but great no, leaders no, produce don't. more leaders. Not necessarily. I, I, uh, I, I, uh, David, I, stop. <laughs> the, well, I just want to say this. Look, there was a real difference 
When I first came to Washington in the early 1970s, the World War II generation was basically the, the group that was running things at that time. And I can tell you the ethos of that generation was quite different from what we see today. And it was had a lot more to do with the fact that, that, a, bunch of, that a bunch of them all went through the war. And that, you know, right. and that assault and stall was saluting some br Polish kid from Brooklyn. That was a very democratizing quality. So when I got there, there were strong Democrats there, there were strong Republicans there, but there was a sense that first and foremost, people were strong Americans. Right. And that sense has changed. And it, and it is, it has given way to this sense of, it's us against them. It's, you know, if you're not with me, you must be my enemy. You know, we, and, and so now you get Democrats who eat together and Republicans eat together, but they don't even eat at the same table. They don't send their kids to the same schools. They don't worship in the same churches together anymore. They don't go to worship in the same synagogues together anymore. There is a lot of this kind of separation out. And what I see coming behind, the reason I salute the younger generation is, I think this younger generation is putting aside some of that. I think there's a culture about the younger generation saying that's nonsense. Let's move beyond that. And do we have to wait for them? No, but I think we ought to salute the fact that there is help on the way. I, I think that um, some members. At least members, I hope so. Sorry, I, I think that what you said about the democratizing experience of, of fighting a common battle, of being in service together, even if it's military service, it's service together. Mm -hmm. I think part of the younger generation wants that, seeking it. They're the people behind national service. I don't think everybody is automatically. That is, again, I want to say it's not just emerging out of a generation. It's emerging because there's, there is conscious effort to put the values forward. Without articulation of the values, it doesn't happen automatically just because of generational experience. I mean, with the GEs and the IBMs, IBM's the one I know really, really well, it's a really conscious effort to articulate values, to engage everybody in a discussion of values, right. to think about the, the extended family that the company is a part of. It has to be an explicit effort. And I think I may have gotten us off track a little because I never like it when you disagree with me. No, 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 because, no, no, because by saying that it's in institutions as though people have nothing to do with it. Of course, our will has something to do with it. But if we don't stand up and discuss values and what we stand for and find that common ground, IBM has managed to create a commonality of values globally. I saw this in Egypt, which is about as culturally different from mm -hmm. a US corporation as we could get. Um, but they have the discussion about values explicitly. They don't talk about religion. That's people's private business. That's people's private lives. In fact, those companies have to find the things that people have in common and that unite people because business is inherently superficial. I mean, it's not deep. It's only about transactions and finding some commonalities. So they put aside the things that divide people yet they create ways for people to be able to express their differences. So in Minnesota, a state you know well, in Rochester, Minnesota, they now have washing stations for the Muslims for their prayers in IBM facilities. Mm -hmm. So they allow people to express themselves individually, but the stress is entirely upon active, out loud, vocal conversations about common values. And we haven't had that recently. We, again, I, I throw this back to us. Where is our concept of the commons, of what we owe each other? But isn't that the leader's job? That's what the leader should do. Now, instead, you, of, instead of getting these conflicts over values and saying, well, here are the values I want you to sign up for, and here's 14 values. No, it's to bring people together and then empower them to go out and make something happen. And I think the organization model we need Institutions still have a hierarchical model. If I told all the people in this room under 30 that we're going to create a new model of information and we're going to have it all centralized in the back room at Harvard University and every information I've run through there, you'd say, forget it. We have a very democratic model of information through the internet. I think our institutions haven't followed suit to the point where everyone can contribute. Why do you think there's so many successful internet sites? It's because it's a very democratic model. But around that, we have to have a set of values for our institution. That's what leaders should be doing. And many of our leaders are not doing, they're using values to divide, unlike 
I, I want to jump in with an example very quickly about the internet democratization and values because IBM's new statement of values was created by what they called a values jam right. on the internet right. in which all 330,000 people could weigh in on what they thought it was and then a group of a task force at corporate synthesized that. They did the same thing with ideas for innovation. They're using the technology to include more and more people in a common dialogue. But remember, we've always got counter tendencies too because we're also in an I world. I can get my site, my HBS. It's also a way to fragment. So it's again what we expect and demand, not what the technology does for us. Now we've talked about institutions and the need for collaboration, but at the end of the day, as individuals like the ones out here in the audience who make the institutions work, do you have to have a common meaning? And you talk about values. How do we get consensus on what values should bring us together? And, and is that an important part of authentic leadership? I, I absolutely think it is. I think Rosebeth's given you one example, but I think a community has to have a common set of values. But you don't get down to such levels of specificity that you force people out. It has to be something people can come together around. And I think that's extremely important that we provide that glue. It cannot be separating values. I mean, I thought what the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs said was terrible. The military has been the institution that's brought people together. It opened up opportunities for people of different races. I have the, some of the best students in my class are females that just graduated, you know, that just got back from two tours of duty in Iraq. One of them's going back for a third tour because General Petraeus is her mentor. You know, these are some of the best leaders in my class. They're going back, they're committed. But, you know, to say now we're only going to let some people into the military and others can't come in, I don't understand this. We have to have institutions that bring people together. Sam Palmasano just laughed when he heard, when somebody suggested that you're going to exclude people. He said, you can't exclude people, my people. We need all the best talent we can get. We want all of you in, and, but we need to, to create that glue of what we believe in as a group. David, now, Rosa Beth has brought up this issue of fragmentation. You mentioned that after World War, World War II there was something to unite around. Is there for this new generation, as much hope as, as exists with, with us, is there, is there something that will corral us together, you think, without some external force? Yeah, I, I, actually, I, as much as I decry where we are today, I continue to believe there are some signs of hope out there. I do believe that there are certain issues now that are because, that, that, that the nature of politics is as issues build up and become more and more pressing and we fail to act on them, they, that generates a certain kind of pushback or momentum to change things. And I think of what, you're, what, what Rosabeth is saying about social entrepreneurs, there are people, and clearly why Wendy Kopp has caught on, because there is so much inequity in our educational system that when she goes out and asks people to, you know, after college to go spend two years in a tough urban school, You've got 8 to 10 percent of the graduating class here at Harvard who's now willing to do that. 8 to 10 percent at Dartmouth, at Cornell, at Yale, at Spelman. She was just down in Austin. She's got a growing number. And a lot of kids now are taking Teach for America opportunities over going to Goldman Sachs. Right. That is a real change in a sense that the, the, there is a response to and a reason these so many people are signing up and getting into charter schools is there are a lot of very talented young people now who want to get into this. I think there's another issue that is also drawing people in, and, and that's clearly going to be the climate. And that this issue is now, uh, uh, you know, it's become pervasive enough and people find an urgency about this that they're going to respond, and I think you're going to see a real movement now come together. Uh, that is going to be, uh, it's going to cross generations, by the way, and it's going to cross sectors. And I think a third one that you're seeing right now growing in importance is, is global health. Yeah. The, the, it is a, it's, it's quite, quite interesting to read applications to the public service schools uh, here this year and see the rise of talented people who want to get involved with tackling issues of global health, poverty, uh, uh, HIV AIDS, other issues that, that go into that. I think there are a number of these things that are starting to create a sense of the commons again. Yeah. And that people are beginning to feel we need that. I happen to believe that spirituality is also on the rise and expresses many of those same values. 
uh, and, uh, and we're seeing it in the rise in, in students who are taking courses in religion. We're seeing it in all sorts of other ways. Uh, when I first came to this school uh, seven years or so ago, uh, you know, people didn't talk about God. It's, it's in, like, it's in, the, in, in, in classrooms. And now it's, it's a common uh, source of conversation about people's uh, spiritual beliefs. And I think that's a, I, I see some real changes that are underway. And what, what a political leader often does is to begin articulating those things in ways that seem fresh and give you a sense of, of redefining reality. Warren Bennis makes the argument that one of the most important things a leader does is define reality. Uh, and Max Pree makes that argument too. Uh, that, that that's one of the most important things a leader has to do is to, for a group, should do for a group, is to help define reality. And, and in my judgment, one of the reasons that Obama is now, uh, people are falling, you know, so intrigued and are and falling in love with Obama is that he's, he is saying things. He's defining reality in fresh ways. And that people, and it's capturing people's imagination. We don't know whether this young fellow, how much you know, weight he can bear on his shoulders. We're asking, people are investing an awful lot in him, an awful lot of hope in him. But it's striking around the country. And I travel a fair amount. I can just tell you the same conversation that's going on in Cambridge is going on in many, many other parts of the, of, of the country where people are saying, who is this fellow? I'm listening to him. He's saying something. I haven't heard, quite heard it that way. I haven't thought about it that way. And that is, that's leadership. David, I think you've done a great job defining the common. I think these are the four issues of the day. They're the ones I hear. And I think we could easily get agreement in this group that no one institution can solve the problems of global warming or of health, of global health, or of, uh, you know, and of certainly not of spirituality. Uh, I think these are the major issues of the day. I think the real issue, and you get back to it with your idea, teacher, remember, no one's asking us to do anything. They're saying, you know, we'll cut your taxes, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. No one's asking us to do anything. We had a golden opportunity after 9-11 to say people wanted to be asked. People want to be asked. They want to get in the game. You know, John F. Kennedy did that, you know. Uh, the, you know, the person whose name is on this school, that's what he said, you know. And I think people, young and old alike, want to be asked because you know why? They're searching for meaning and significance. They want to make a difference. And they're saying, I don't want to be like my parents, where I worked all the time and there was no meaning. I want to make a difference. Right. But somebody's got to right. ask them right. to do it. I, told, I mean, this, we, this is why, by the way, the three of us are working on an initiative that will produce more leaders for those problems that you articulated so well, at all ages, yeah. by the way. Um, I just want to add that I think people get tired of being depressed. <laughs> I think that we have taken to excess a kind, of, a kind of world, a kind of being, a, particularly in the last six or seven years, and I don't want to call this ideological, but we've been pretty depressed in America. And I think people are ready to say there's more you can feel, do, be. Leaders also, of course, call on people's best selves. They help state aspirations. I like that redefine reality. They also rewrite history all the time so as to create another set of possibilities out of what your past is. It's one of the reasons I'm resisting saying we have a leadership deficit because I believe every single person sitting in this room can be a leader. I think we yeah. have, could have a leadership surplus if we knew how to call forth those parts of people that are their best impulse, their way to inspire other people, and let everybody lead in their own way in those areas they do best. And that sounds idealistic, but I think we're going to move into a time where idealism and hope are going to start getting more attention than greed, selfishness, and being depressed all the time because you don't have as much as somebody else. Yeah. You know, that's a great All set. That's a great segue to open it up to the audience and get some <laughs> questions tonight. We have four microphones lined up here. And Two up there. If you could come, introduce yourself, um, briefly state who you are, um, and then your question. And what we'll do is we'll try to get um, as many questions in, given the vast surplus that we have. So if you'll work with us, we'll work with you and each other to have a robust conversation. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Yes, ma'am. 
Hi, thanks very much for doing this at the Kennedy School. I think it's really important that the focus on leadership really start um, in the public sector, as y'all stated. Um, my name is Annabelle Farrar. I'm a second year here at the Kennedy School in the MPP program. Um, my question is about women in leadership positions. Um, I wanted to get y'all's thoughts on the wave of women that we've seen entering into professional and graduate schools. They're now the majority of the entering classes, um, and I think it's been that way for the past five years or so. Do you think that's enough to make up for the disparity um, really the shameful disparity of women in leadership positions, um, especially higher level leader positions. Do you think that's enough to make up for the disparity or do you think that there's other obstacles that have to be overcome um, for women to finally achieve um, equal stature in leadership positions? David, you want to take that one? No, we're both <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. No, well, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, I believe that women have the same talents, the same potential. I think that stereotyping women as um, as different, worse was a problem years ago, and that stereotyping women as different, better, as in relationship skills, and we need collaboration, is an equal trap. I think that one that we again, well, to use that word institution again, we haven't we haven't changed institutional patterns enough. I have a chapter in this forthcoming book called "Work, Family, and the Woman Question." Well, the woman question is, did she stumble because she was a woman? Which it takes more women before, in leadership before we stop asking that question. Um, or did she succeed because? But if we don't solve the work and family issues, that to me is one of the remaining barriers. Um, I think that there, there is, are still some subtle, some assumptions that women have the talent, they have the education, they have the drive, they have the passion. But there might be those years when they can't figure out how to do it, do it all, and we're not helping them. I had what I called, when I was pregnant with my son, I was a, professor, a, a tenured professor at Yale at the time, I had what I called a macho pregnancy, because I had to prove to everybody that I wasn't going to miss a beat. And you know that was really pretty horrible when I think back to those years. So if we don't, part of this values question is how do we put family back as a priority in workplaces such that people don't have to apologize for having them or make trade-offs that mean we lose some of the talent of people like you? Because once you're out, it gets a lot harder to get back in. I can tell you this is just a big a concern for my male students as it is for my female students. Now, males are not quite birthing yet, but... Uh, <laughs> But it is a big concern uh, of theirs. And I think corporations that don't do this aren't going to be able to recruit in the future. Right. But I think we've got to get away from the idea that I had when I got out of school that you know I get out, get my MBA from Harvard, it's a straight line to the top. This is nonsense. Li journey, leadership is a winding journey. And there's no reason we can't go off ramp for a few years and take care of our kids or our wife works full time as a surgeon or whatever. We need to have more flexible career patterns built in. You don't have to be CEO by the time you're 44 years old. You can be CEO at 58, like Marilyn Carlson Nelson. That's when she got to be CEO. So why not? Why does it everything have to be at the top? We're going to live till you guys are going to live till 95 or 100. So it doesn't have to happen right away. There's only one problem with women in business, at least. I can tell you what the problem was: the door was closed. Now the doors are open. Hey, you know, if, you know, you look at all the women we interviewed, and a lot we didn't interview became CEOs, like. Brenda Barnes and Sarah Lee took seven years off in her career and came back, and a year later she was CEO of Sarah Lee. Indra Nui is now CEO of PepsiCo, the CEO of Kraft. And Andrea Hutch. Jung has 5.5 million people in working for her. Five point, you name any organization in the world that has 5.5 million people. Her organization is about the empowerment of women. There are so many, so many women stepping up, and I tell you, and you know, Harvard finally caught on that you know, having a woman president was uh, not a bad idea. You look at how many major American institutions are led, uh, educational institutions are led by women. Uh, and I know many of these women and they're, you know, so I don't think, if you look at the transcripts of my classroom across the river and you just didn't have to listen to the voices, just look at the transcript, you couldn't tell, you couldn't discern which were the comments made by women or which are made by men. Uh, Except the men make more of them. Yeah. The men cl still claim more airtime. Oh, that's because you just don't call on the women. <laughs> oh, now, Bill. Oh, man. Well, Sorry, I didn't mean that. I just it's <laughs> not true. I do. That's how I learned this. So. Well, in fairness, in that, we'll go to the next question. Yeah. 
Good evening, and thank you for being here and for your insights. My name is Greg Christian. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I'm in the Senior Executive Fellows Program here at the Kennedy School, and I'd like to focus close attention on the public sector for just a moment. To what degree do you all feel that <clears throat> the, excuse me, the system of political appointments contributes to the leadership deficit, and if you do feel that it's a contributing factor, what do we do to fix it? Well, I'm not, let's be sure we have our terms straight. The, you mean the, the number of political appointees or the quality of political appointees or both? Yes, both. Uh, okay. Well, particularly just the, the, the fact that there are so many political appointees that they, uh, they're often friends of the, of the sure. executive but, but, and, and they may I, not be the greatest leaders for the positions that they're you, in. You put your finger on a very sensitive point. Um, as Paul Volcker has argued for some time, we do have a quiet crisis, which is gradually getting noisier uh, in the civil service at the federal level, and I think it's also showing up at the state and local level now, and that is that the, the number of layers of political appointees that have been introduced has gotten thicker uh, over time, so that increasingly there is, uh, and, and the quality of people going into those jobs has not gotten better. In many instances, it's gotten worse. Uh, you find... Uh, uh, that uh, there are a lot of political hacks appointed to to those uh, to those jobs, and I think it's discouraging for people to go, uh, the really talented people to go into public service today within governmental structures as civil servants. Uh, we, we we've got this problem. A whole lot of people are retiring, as you know, from civil service. The top really talented people, many of whom came in. 30 or 40 years ago when there was this wave of idealism and they were drawn into the public life and now they're retiring and we're, with the talent pool at the front end of that is, is in my judgment, shrinking uh, because it's, it's, it's for many of the young people we see come through here worry that if they go into civil service they're going to get into some of these bureaucratic dead end and they're not going to have any real leadership capacity. And unlike corporations, which are the best corporations are pushing authority down that the role of, this, of the leader in a corporation has become a leader of leaders, uh, the government is not doing that. It's been very slow in that sense. So that a lot of people aren't going in, and then you have to face this alternative that if you want to go to law school and go to work in a big law firm, you can make three times as much money uh, right off the bat. So I think it's a serious problem that would be helped a great deal by thinning out those layers and by making government civil service itself much more entrepreneurial and giving people, empowering people who are in the civil service to do far more than they are now doing. And that is happening. There's one, there's one governmental institution where that's happening, and that's the U.S. military, especially in the U.S. Army. Uh, I think one of our next questioners will, will, will tell you that. There is, the whole Petraeus thing is to, and part of what's going on in the Army is to, is to empower the young officers, and the young officers are in turn expected to empower the enlisted far more than has been in the past because if you're in Iraq, one day, you know, you're, you're fighting something, the next day you're writing the Constitution, the third day you're worrying about the sewage. And you've got this, this range of problems that you've got to solve as a young officer in Iraq that you simply can't be narrow waiting for orders from the top. You've got to be very entrepreneurial, very free-flowing, and what they call now pentathletes and the Army, that you've got to have sort of a, a range of skills as a young leader. And we ought to be doing that in the civil service as well. And I think we will get far better people because it'll be attractive to go work when you really have, you're, you're dealing with really important questions, but if your hands are tied and you got some hack who's 31 years old who just came off and, you know, whatever, uh, it's discouraging. Yes. yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Talib Asalam. I'm a uh, technical analyst at Harvard Business School, and I play basketball occasionally with uh, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> so I, I just uh, I, I wanted to focus more on um, the topic of values that you uh, brought out. Um, I know that our next generation of leaders um, need, need to have balance. They need to be able to, to have internal values, yet uh, uh, have some sort of common ground with others in order to get things achieved. But h how does one achieve that? How does one get to that? Because I, I talk to many of my friends who um, 
they're very devoutly Christian, so they oppose homosexuality, but they don't hate gay people. You know, and then I have other friends who um, don't look at homosexuality as a sin, but they don't hate God. So how do you bring these people back together? Because over, over time, we've, we've, we've pulled them all apart. Once, you know, there was a time where we all worshiped in the same church. Now we're all deciding to go to di different churches based on how strongly Christian we are. I'm, I'm just trying to look for an answer to that because there's a lot of those people who are deciding you know what, I'm not going to go into politics because I have to make a choice. And those choices are not choices that I want to make. How, how do we do it? Tough question. This is really a tough question, so I, I don't want to, um, to venture in and say something glib at all. I mean, but there is a difference between spirituality that embraces a sense of what's fundamentally human and what's a human mission on earth versus spirituality that excludes because it says my group has the only right way to express it. And unless we can have a debate about that that doesn't sound like it's religion bashing, and I think our founding fathers of this country had to deal with this, and it's one of the reasons why I think they wisely said we should separate church and state so that people can have, but they also wanted freedom of religion. So doesn't that sound like a contradiction? Freedom of religion, but no established religion so that people could express themselves however they saw the world, but could not, when they were in the public sphere, say that my way is automatically better than your way and if you're not exactly like me, then we can't come together and graze our cattle in that same village square. You want to comment briefly, Dave? Yeah, I, I, I believe that, uh, that you're, we're seeing growing evidence that the, the, the way to overcome those religious differences is by find, finding common projects in which we work together. And if you heard Richard Sizik, who was here at the Social Entrepreneurs Conference, uh, two weekends ago at the, uh, at the school, students from the business school and the county school helped put on. He was a, from the evangelicals. He's a major figure in the evangelicals. He's controversial, but he was the most articulate person on global climate change and why we needed to work together of almost anyone I've ever heard. Uh, he was just terrific, and it's so clear that there are people in the evangelical movement who are prepared to work with progressives who have long been worried about this issue. And you can build bridges that transcend some of these other questions. Or take, take uh, Rick Warren, who has been here on this, on this campus, been here at this forum uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, he wants to work on issues of poverty uh, in, in ways to build bridges. And it's, it's a really encouraging thing. But I, I want to go back to something more equally important. And that is something that, that, that uh, Rosabeth was talking about earlier, and that is national service. The, if, if you go out to uh, here in Western Massachusetts and go out can, uh, Mount Trulock, is that, isn't that the name of it uh, in Western Massachusetts? Greylock, Greylock, Greylock. Uh, and it's so interesting. That was an old CCC area. And if you go out and, and hike the, around up there and you see the pictures and then the statements and the letters that these young CCC guys wrote back there in the 30s when the, when the CCUC was formed, it was a wonderfully uh, uh, bonding experience from kids from all different kind of backgrounds. And, and they created, helped to create those, all those hiking paths up there. It's a, it's a terrifically insp inspirational thing about what could be done with a greater commitment to national service today. I mean, the CCC should be a role model of how we can bring people together from different backgrounds and different socioeconomic groups. To, to, to break out of this and get beyond these crazy cul-de-sacs we find ourselves in. Now, I'd like to take a question right up to the leadership level. The role of leaders is to be inclusive, not to be exclusive. When leaders stop, start excluding people based upon their own particular points of view, they're not acting as leaders. Our job is to bring people together and inspire them and empower them around a common cause, a common sense of purpose. But if we exclude people, this is wrong. I, I just say it flat out. 
it is wrong. Any leader that excludes people based on some form of criteria, like national origin or like religion or like a particular point of view, I just think it's wrong. And I don't think you can have institutions in America of any kind, except maybe religious organizations that have creeds, uh, I don't think you can do that in any kind of institution, for-profit, non-profit, or, uh, or government. I think it's our role to be inclusive and to bring people together and find that common ground. That's what leadership is all about. Yes, yes sir. Next question. Hi, thank you. My name is uh, Mark Vogel. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I'm delighted, especially Professor Gergen, to hear you say that there is, uh, you, you believe hope is on the way, because um, I can tell you that my friends and uh, many of the young voters that I've done some work with would also believe that uh, it is indeed on the way in the form of Cory Booker and Adrian Fenty and definitely Barack Obama. Um, one of the uh, tensions that I think you've all sort of talked around is that on the one hand, we need to do a better job of encouraging young people to go into public service and assume leadership roles, but at the same time need to create the space within those institutions for them to actually do work that's meaningful and gratifying. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit where on the continuum of important values you place experience. Um, and to, to what degree, in some ways, is that really a kind of old-fashioned way of determining what constitutes a good leader? Um, not to discount it, obviously it's got areas in which it is valuable, but if the threshold is always, they're not experienced enough, so we're not gonna move out of the way, then I think you, that may explain to some degree why some people perceive uh, current leadership, especially in, in Washington these days, seems so ossified um, and uninspired. There's no substitute for experience, and my advice is go get it. You know, you don't make decisions about going to war unless you've been there. You don't make decisions about health care unless you've watched people live and die and sit stood in the operating room. And my advice to all the students I have is go get it. Get in there, get into the game. Don't just sit back and evaluate. You've got to get into the game, and you've got to learn the complexities of it. And I think we all, that's where you learn. The only place you learn, that's where the only place you learn about your value is when they're tested and they're pressured. Anyone can sit up here and say, oh, I have great values. These are my values. Nonsense. You don't know what your values are until they're tested under pressure. Put yourself in the game and learn what it's all about. The earlier, the better. And, you know, what do you think these young teachers in Teach for America are doing? They're gaining incredible experience. But is it easy? You talk to them. It's very, very tough. This is really hard stuff. They're getting 10 years experience in two. And I just think, I think that's why I love the idea of national service. Just go get it. Because I think you have to have the experience. If you just pontificate about what you think it ought to be for all of you, no way. You've got to be out there and, and have that experience. The more experiences you have, Kevin Shearer was here last week, you know, says in my book, he said, you know, leadership is the most, we are the mosaic of all of our experiences. Well, so have the experiences, and that's where you really learn. That's where you get tested. You learn who you are and how you're going to deal with the situation. And I, I'm just a big advocate for it. Uh, can I just add that I, 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 the issue is not one of experience so much it is, as it is one of judgment. And it's a very important quality to have people of good judgment in positions of, uh, of, of leadership. Uh, and judgment does come in part, it's improved through experience. It's not the only way you get that. But if you go back and read, um, and it's, you can get it here at the Institute of Politics, Ted Sorensen came here a few years ago to talk about 13 days and, uh, the, and the decision-making process with John F. Kennedy, which is a model of, of decision-making. And he talked about the importance of judgment and then elements of where Kennedy got the, his judgment from. And, and partly it was that he, that he blew it on the Bay of Pigs. You know, he came through that searing experience and, and, and learned from it. So he didn't have that experience. But he also was a reader. He, had, he was a very curious mind. And reading Barbara Tuckman's book about the guns of August and miscalculation and how that, got, how that led to a breakdown and, 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 and led to warfare was very important for him. Judgment comes in many different ways. And one of the interesting questions, I think one of the interesting questions about Barack Obama right now is uh, he does not have the long experience that we would ordinarily want in, in that job. And many. I was among them who thought he should wait. But now that he's there, he's there. And, you know, and, and so 
One of the interesting questions is that Nick Kristoff has raised in the Times. He had a really interesting column about it. Did his experiences growing up overseas in the way he did and the various life experiences, in fact, give him instinctively better judgment and give him different kinds of experience than he might have had he been in the Senate for another two terms or something like that and done the normal thing? I think that question is really worth asking. I think we need to... To, to explore the question of, of judgment of these candidates. and I, Some people have terrific judgment when they're 40. Some people don't. Some people can have 25 years of experience and get worse. You know, <laughs> they can get, they can learn, learn the wrong lessons. One year's experience, 25 times. Yeah. The, the one thing, I mean, very, very wise comments, and um, so I can only endorse them, but I do want to say that we would get in trouble if we start getting into generational politics. And I guess that's why I was so concerned before about which generation has which values, et cetera. Um, and that I'm concerned about because in the 90s, actually, only new knowledge was valued. If you went to any company, they wouldn't talk to anybody over 25 because they couldn't possibly understand new technology. Um, now we begin to see that might have caused some problems, but let's not assume that just because of people's age or length of service, in fact, we want a combination in every organization. We want fresh ideas that come from people with fresh eyes and often people who ask naive questions, who don't yet have so much judgment that they censor themselves and therefore will ask, why not? At the same time, we also need wise heads who have been there and understand what it's like. But the wise heads can't use that as an excuse to say, we tried that before and it didn't work nor can the, young people, the younger people say, you're so ossified, you're never open to change. What we really need to do is have a dialogue across those perspectives. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Patrick Connolly. I'm a joint degree student here at the Kennedy School and uh, at HBS as well. Um, thanks to you guys for coming out tonight. Certainly thank uh, Jonathan for taking the time to moderate. He's doing a great job. Yeah. Um, How do you like that tie, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> I promise he didn't uh, pay me to say that. <laughs> Checks on the way. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a question that I hope brings it a little closer to home here for Harvard uh, University. You mentioned that most of the critical problems facing, uh, facing us in the future are going to be interdisciplinary in nature. And I think there's a real sense of, uh, a growing sense of need on the part of students here who want to take classes at a lot of the different graduate schools. I think we're seeing a lot of uh, external parties trying to incentivize the school to um, make changes that allow interdisciplinary course taking. Um, and we, I actually just came back from a meeting where we had a, a joint degree meeting, and I think it was the dean, and I think he's here, so he'll probably correct me if I'm misquoting him, but he said often getting the heads of the graduate schools to agree on, on changes is you know, easier than Middle East peace. So with that in mind, what kind of concrete changes can Harvard University make to allow its students to take classes at different schools? What can the school do to incentivize those students that it's in their interest not to just become a lawyer, not to just become you know, the next CEO of Goldman Sachs, but that they should be taking classes at multiple different institutions? A common calendar would help. That would be, that would be a good structural step. Well, actually, we're working on something now that involves faculty from across five professional schools. So it might be, as in some of the other questions, that you find joint projects that bring the faculty together, and then that creates an environment where those faculty look for students and encourage students to do that. So it's what you keep saying about leadership. We have to lead the way, well, make I'm it very possible. Encouraged, yeah. I'm very encouraged by the joint degree programs. As you probably know, both the faculty here and the faculty at Harvard Business School have uh, now approved a joint degree program in PP, MBA. Uh, formally had done so, the faculty spent a long time looking at this and I'm very excited about because I think we need leaders in the future who are capable of working in government, working in business, and working in nonprofits. All three of those sectors and I think during the course of their lifetime, uh, you may well work in all three of those sectors. I would hope so because I, a life is not just about joining General Motors at 22 and retiring at 65 and going to Florida and dying five years later. There's a lot more to it than that. And, and I think if you want to experience the fullness of life, you have the opportunity to take those experiences across sectors. And 
as you know, the, the business school has a, a program with the, uh, the medical school now, an MD, MBA program. And I think the world is complex enough that we need people with multidisciplinary training. Not everyone. Some people want to be neurosurgeons and that's all they want to do. But I think the multidisciplinary training can be very advantageous. I have to say that I wrote an editorial uh, in the Harvest News trying to get the then Litauer School and the business school, the Harvard Business School together back 40 years ago, but it didn't go over very far. So I'm glad that we got it done. So congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, let me just uh, echo a couple of those things, and, and you, you're good to ask that, Patrick. The, it does seem to me that, and, and, and I know Dean Elwood's very on top of this, uh, it's the single most important thing we could do quickly is to align the calendars. And if we could just do that at the, at the graduate professional school levels for next year, that would be an enormous step forward. It would obviously be better, best if the, if the FAS was, was part of that process as well. Yeah. But it would greatly facilitate if you could get, you know, align the calendars and also align the class hours so that people could move back and forth among the campuses without having to sort of juggle. As, as it's so difficult for a lot of students to, to make these, mm -hmm. these decisions now because of this. Uh, and, and maybe transportation could be also be added in to, to facilitate that. We've made great steps forward with the, with the joint degree uh, programs. Uh, and, but I think you're going to see more and more jointness uh, in the years ahead. That's going to take time, uh, but I, I'm, I'm convinced we're moving in, in that direction because, as Bill George says, it's going to be really important for young people in the future to have broad, to be broad gauged, to have, to have broadband qualities that they can range across and do things in different sectors and be, be in one sector and be very familiar with another sector and to be able to work and collaborate in ways so that you can be empathic with the people you're working with and understand what they're facing, uh, which is a very important part of the collaborative effort that, that Bill was, uh, George was talking about earlier. But I also think we ought to be thinking about um, more inter interdisciplinary courses and also some sort of facility in Alston that would, would, would bring people together in a, in, a, in a different way. Right now, we, our students you know, have their centers in their own schools. And for example, if you people over the business school would just open up your damn gymnasium, this would be a lot easier for everybody. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know, I kind, yeah, of, yeah. I kind of like your Harvard Square location yeah, myself. Yeah. Well, but, but, but we, ought to, we ought to find facilities that, where people can share and have experiences and do things together so that, that a lot of this begins to, to break down. I, I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's unimaginable we're going to be as, as separated out 15 years from now as we are today. It's just unimaginable. It's going to be a very, very different kind yeah. of experience, oh, yeah. don't you think? This, right. our our leader, leadership this is our Institute, Leadership David, Institute, that, we yeah, exactly. that we're across, inching up. Across, yeah. across the whole school, yeah. and we have forums like right. this where everyone come together across schools. Yeah. I mean, not exactly. to be grand, but you know, the 20th century was the era of specialized knowledge. We invented many of the, prof of the professions. We learned what in-depth training meant. The 21st century is going to be the era of interdisciplinary knowledge, of integration, of where the highest art form and form of thinking is to be able to integrate across mm -hmm. rather right. than, and while still having depth. Right. Right. And we, so we also, but it's also going to be the knowledge question. Uh, you know, you know, Howard Gardner's here, who really introduced the notion of uh, and, uh, uh, multiple intelligences. And it's going to be really important for people coming to the Kennedy School to understand reality in a different way. In years ahead, we're going to have to understand all the new research that's going on. A neurological research, you're going to have to understand. We, Jen Lerner is just coming here this next year on the faculty who really thinks about decision making in neurological terms. That's going to be very helpful to have someone who follows that kind of brain research. We're going to need the 21st century is going to be so much about the drive for knowledge mm -hmm. and understanding, and much of that's going to be in science and technology. And you're not going to be able to go to the business school or the Kennedy School or anyplace else, education school, without being more Catholic in that sense and trying to understand the, 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 the direction of research and understand. And that's going to require a much more, uh, it's going to require a very different kind of educational environment, I think. Patrick, you left us with a wonderful place to end tonight. Thank you for that. Um, the evening is drawn nigh. Let's talk about, so talk about the book. Say something more about that book. You've got to talk about Bill George's book. Hold on. Yeah. You've got to yeah. see this. Here. Oh, yes. So, so Bill George has written this book, True North, 
and <laughs> he will actually be signing copies of the book over in the Charles lobby. I understand. Charles. Afterwards. Yeah, reception right after this. Yes, sir. And um, the book is truly unique in the sense that it's a workbook of sorts. If you want to want to actually learn how, what steps you can actually take to be more authentic in your leadership, I actually. I, I purchased a, a hardback and then I found that I could get a paper like manuscript where I could take notes and actually work through the notebook and I thought that was, that was tremendous. But I think what's interesting, especially here at the Kennedy School, is I think Bill is preaching to the choir because the choir needs to rehearse and I think we take that for granted. And so I'm very thankful for Bill for that and for every, anyone that wants to join the choir, I think True North is a great book for you to go out and get. So thank you. Thank you, Bill.